In another laughter-packed episode of The Grumpy Gits, we talk all things Elon. What will he bring to Twitter? Will it be a boost for the platform or the death of it? We talk to the amazing Kelly Waite, star of Obsessive Compulsive Cleaners and Country House Cleaners, about life with OCD, bullying, and her new short film and documentary. We then take our hats off to Eddie Izzard and ask the question, is the pronouns debate taking away from her bigger picture in politics? This week's Dear Grumpy Gits looked at a sexy haunting, and see you next Tuesday pitches Grumpy Git against Grumpy Git with some truly bizarre what-ifs. So kick back, grab a bevy, laugh along with the Grumpy Gits, and remember, don't be grumpy alone. The Grumpy Gits are proudly partnered with the Disability Expo being held at XL in London on the 6th and 7th of July 2023. It's going to be an incredible event, so follow the links in the description to sign up. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are watching this. And welcome to another fantastic episode of The Grumpy Gets. As always, I am your host with the most though, Adam Pearson, leading you through this journey of what will most likely be confusion, hilarity, and a bit more confusion. But I am not alone. Oh no. I am joined by my usual ragtag of misfits, merry men, and miscreants. Up first, a man who statistically is less of a threat to national security than Suella Braverman and Shamima Begum. Chris Lee Smith, how are you, good sir? I'm good, mate. Um, it's turned cold, so I've got a jumper on tonight. Um, oh, yeah, I, I wanted to apologise for my outburst last week as well on the last episode. I was quite angry. So, um, and I think I got given a very good piece of advice, which I didn't follow, is don't let Simon wind you up, which I didn't follow <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> is that because so you lost I'm, the quiz? No, no I, I think I'm going to, you know, just... Try and take a deep breath when Simon pisses me off. Actually, we did a count during the edit, and you actually didn't win. <laughs> there was a missed count at the beginning. Yeah. I think they're trying it on, Adam. I think we won fair and square. You can oh, count it yourself. I, the raw footage, uh, we can send it to you. You can I, count it yourself. It's on GG. I, I, <laughs> I, I picked up on a missed count while the quiz was going on. Just didn't say anything. <laughs> 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 That's why oh, I love it, you, Adam. You know when to just yeah, I knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would have done the same. I, I, I've mastered the subtle art of shutting the fuck up. <laughs> it's really taken me years to master, but now we're here. But I, I'm glad you're doing well, Chris. You're you're practicing the, the choir art of calm. And also, a man who has more chance of winning I'm a Celebrity than Matt Hancock, and he's not even in it. <laughs> Duncan Casburn, how are you, good sir? I'm pretty good. A uh, bit bit rough. Uh, we were supposed to record on Tuesday, but uh, we couldn't, so uh, I'm coming down with a cold or a flu or something, I think, so I'm feeling a bit under the weather, but uh, I'm here anyway. We'll, we'll get you through it, good sir. Just that, get through this good. episode... And, and it'll all be fine. And finally, last but by no means least, bear with me. You see what I did there? You see what I did there? You, you might have noticed that recently it's sorry, been quite stormy. Sorry, this is the man who refused to dress up on the Halloween episode because he's a fucking adult, quote unquote. He's got a, a Pokemon behind him. He's got a teddy bear down on the floor. <laughs> Leg- Lego behind him. Lego behind him. Various <laughs> games. <laughs> oh, it, it, somewhere, I've, the, got, he... I've, got another, I've, I've got another bear. That's, and I, I, I shit you not, in a wheelchair. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that thought I was, for those of you that thought I was joking. <laughs> nice. And that's official build of air merch as well. Like, yeah. Um, where Keep was it I? Rolling. That's Keep it. it rolling. Yep, yep, yep. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Um, some of you may have noticed that the weather's been quite stormy recently, and you may have thought, oh, someone pissed off God. Yeah, I know. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> 
if you haven't seen Halloween episode, go back and watch it. Uh, Simon Samson, the great blasphemer. How are you, good sir? <laughs> I haven't been struck down by a lightning just yet, so I'm absolutely fine. I did get some uh, fantastic news this week, which I can't share until the next episode. Um... Uh, regarding access all areas which is my film which is coming out soon and um i really want to share the information it's like i have this fantastic amazing wonderful news and i can't tell anyone well that that's a little teaser for the next episode in two weeks time put it in your calendars i know i have i haven't anyway <laughs> let's get on with <laughs> Let's get on with the show and our regular opening segment, Chris Lee Smith. I'm so scared. What have you got for us? Okay. Question one. Rate the Grumpy Gits from one to four for their IQ and what you think their IQ is. Let's start (laughs) with... Let's start with Adam. Okay. Obviously, one this... having the highest IQ and yep. what their I- uh, IQ is on top of it as well. Okay. I Last time I tested my IQ, it was 148, which is quite high. Well, so 130 I'm gonna my... is very high, 70 yeah. is low, 100 is smack bang in the middle, what most people are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like I'm, I'm one four eight. So that, okay. that's quite high. But I also think IQ tests and IQ in general isn't the most accurate way to measure actual intelligence. It just no. means you're really good at that particular way of thinking. Yes. So, so the, this the, the list I'm about to give isn't saying someone's an idiot. It's just saying that they maybe think a different way to to that. So I'm going to put myself number one. Okay. I'm going to go me, Duncan, Chris, and Simon, just because it'll annoy him. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what are you guessing our IQs are? So I reckon Duncan is 108. Okay. I reckon you're hovering around 100, maybe slightly above 102. And I reckon Simon, like, 11? <laughs> Don't you have to have 13 IQ just to breathe? <laughs> no, I reckon Simon is a- around the mid 90s. Okay. Wow. Just because wow. it's, 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 well, no, it's, it's just it's that way of thinking. I, I reckon think... you're smarter than that, but I reckon the way IQ test is structured doesn't lend itself well to how you think. Okay, right. So next. Uh... I'm going to save it, actually. Duncan, what do you think? <laughs> is the, 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 the <laughs> oh, I, I, I honestly, I, I, I'm kind of like Adam, and this isn't getting wiggling out of it. I will answer the question, but there's there's different IQs. So for the intellectual IQ, there's a certain list, but for social IQ, it's completely different. I think. Yeah, <laughs> for that kind of thing, and there's, you know, there's 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 book smarts and street smarts, and there's certainly a world of difference among us in those areas. Um, I I I actually think I, I think Simon's pretty smart uh, intellectually, but I agree. I don't think the IQ questions would suit him. Okay. Um, so I pretty much I I I yeah I know I know what my IQ tested at, but. I still think I, you're actually quite intelligent, Chris. But you, you're no, he's not. <laughs> he, oh, he genuinely is. He's actually <laughs> he's got a very good understanding of social cues and dealing with people. He's not necessarily patient with them, but <laughs> with some of them, with yeah. just some of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll. I'll Agree with Adam, but I think I think you and I are pretty on par, Chris. To be honest, I think. It, it okay. Scores. Well, I know I'm a one twenty eight, so okay. I put you around the same. We know what Adam's is. He's just told us. Yep. Simon, and, uh, Simon I think you'd be. I can't. This is it. I think. Come on, just give us a score. Don't try and cover <laughs> your back. Just give us a score. Come on, Duncan. I, I reckon he's a, a one ten. One ten. That's a nice way to cover your back. <laughs> 
Let, let Adam take the fire, okay? <laughs> right. Uh, let's go. That's, that's my social IQ. <laughs> right. Let's see what. Um, I'm going to go in the foreign line as well. Let's see what lie Simon has to tell us here. Let's go. What? Let's have the list and what? the IQ numbers. Go for it. Well, I'm not going to give you my IQ number. It's not your weight. Oh, no, there is a reason behind this. Okay. So when I re- when I returned to education in my early twenties, um, I was immediately di- diagnosed with dyslexia, which wasn't picked up in school. Um, I dropped out of school at sixteen with nothing. Okay. And when I returned to education, went through all the assessments and stuff, and I actually had um, mental health assessments, dyslexia assessments, and whatever. And <clears throat> I actually got referred to Mensa because my IQ was off the charts. Um, and I actually took part in lots of men's research for a couple of years. Um, I haven't had an IQ test for a very long time, um, <clears throat> but you have to have a certain amount of IQ to be in the men's uh, community. So, what what IQ do you have to have to be in the men's community? I'm not going to tell you that. You'll have to Google oh, it's all right. it. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, what do you mean? You're not going to tell me, but I can Google it. Yeah, do, do you no, know no. or not? Um, is, 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 forgotten. is this the IQ of memory? <laughs> is, is, that, is that the good news you've got this week? The so, IQ you need to have to get into memory. <laughs> Can't tell you, mate. Can't tell you. Anyway, anyway, you, you have to be uh, of a certain scale to actually do that, uh, to get into Mensa, uh, or to take part in the Mensa research. <clears throat> um, anyway, um, I would say me... A uh, uh, very high score. Adam Would you stay, or, sta- would you stay or say? Just, cl- you know, clearly. Adam it was obviously 148. And Duncan, I'd say you about 128. Yeah, you're a smart chap. Chris is thick as shit. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think, um, I don't think you went to Menza, Simon. I didn't say I went to Menza. I said I was referred to Menza and I took oh, part in Menza I, I research. I don't think you were referred. Also, oh. a sign of low IQ is lying as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I actually can't I, find it. I can't find it on Google. When when I got the dyslexia report through, it actually says my IQ on it. So, question two. Should have had a stress ball, but okay. <laughs> zombie apocalypse. Another zombie apocalypse question. And it starts when the four of us are together. Who are we choosing as our leader to keep us all safe? This time, let's start with. Simon. Oh, you know, I wasn't paying attention. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> I swear. It, mate, mate, fucking Mensa. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I, had, I, I had an email come through and I just thought, that looks quite important. I thought, I'd just better check it just in case. <laughs> Zombie apocalypse. And it yeah. starts when the four of us are together. Who are we choosing as leader to keep us all safe? It's not me. I've got no tacticians at all. You know, if I play Fortnite, I'm I'm dying all the time. So it's not me. <laughs> Against um, seven year olds. Sorry. Against seven year olds. Yeah, they kill me all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. <in> the dream. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually, actually, to be honest, I think Adam would be quite tactical because he plays a lot of video games. So I would actually give that to him. Actually, yeah. Okay. Okay, same question to Duncan. I know there's different things. So, like, it's a zombie apocalypse, so it's it's about survival. It's not just about tactics. Because Chris plays a stupid amount of video games as well, so you and Adam would both be quality on that. I think a leader needs to have an element of diplomacy, though. And I think it's often the best leaders, they're not necessarily the best at everything, but they know how to assemble the best of everybody to do their best. So, on that, I'd put myself, but from the tactical perspective, it would be Crystal Radham. Okay, Adam? I, I I agree. I reckon Duncan has a sort of like calmness to him, where he, he probably reacts really well under pressure and doesn't make decisions too hastily and, and thinks things through, whereas I'm, I'm quite sporadic and quite shotgun. And like a kid on your numbers going, this is amazing. We're going to kill him. Kill him all. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I'd be awful. I, I reckon you'd be all right, Chris. I reckon you'd just moan him to death. 
out moon a zombie. I, I, I reckon they'd be like, brains. And they'd be like, oh, here, here we go again. Same shit every day. And then the, zomb- and then, and then the zombies would be like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> they just go away. <laughs> yeah, 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 so, totally. d- by default, would that make me the best leader? <laughs> if no, I just not, moaned not, them away <laughs> not, not, not the best I've leader. solved the apocalypse certainly. for fuck's sake <laughs> what else do I need to do certainly the best plan of attack and yeah I reckon Simon by his own admission just last yeah okay so I reckon Duncan Chris me Simon okay third question you and one other grumpy git have been cast in the movie Brokeback Mountain who are you picking? <laughs> Who are you? Ah. I was going to try and get through this without laughing. Who are you? <laughs> so I was reading it fast. Who are you picking to do the tent scene with? <laughs> Duncan, you're first. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to make an addition to that. Are you top or bottom as well? <laughs> Come on. Question uh, three. I, I'm going to go Simon because he won't be able to chase me <laughs> as easily once we're in that position. And I, I think Simon's a catch and not a pitcher. So I'll go top. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're here, and Simon. So. <laughs> Poor Simon. Mm. <laughs> oh. Right. Let's go with Adam next. What's Brokeback Mountain? You know what Brokeback Mountain is. You know exactly what it is. And you know exactly what the tent scene is as well. Don't give me that. Oh, uh, fuck. Like, um, hi, Mum. Cheers to your ongoing support in watching this. This is the worst question you've ever come up with. <laughs> I know. I d- I'll, I'll be honest, I don't feel good about it. Mate. Uh, no, you're good. <laughs> oh, shit. You're good. Oh, you. I don't feel good about it. I just wrote I it didn't. and asked it. <laughs> can I... Uh, oh, mate. Can I just take one of the horses? Like, <laughs> what, into the... T- what? Your... Bottom or top with the horse? <laughs> I don't mean you're walking out alive if you're on the bottom. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna. Okay, I've thought this through, and I'm yeah. just using my very own unique brand of logic here. I reckon it's less awkward for everyone if I pick Simon because at least he won't feel it going in. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. What, what if he turns around and goes, is it in yet? What, what do you say then? <laughs> then, I, then I will lie and go, yep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, finally, Simon. So, from my recollection, I haven't seen the film, believe it or not. Strange, that, isn't it? Um, yeah. I, I know of it. Um, and I understand these are cowboys, aren't they, who ride horses and have guns. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I would yeah. shoot myself in the head before I would let any Answer of you touch me. fucking question. <laughs> for once in no. your life. <laughs> no, under no circumstances. I will, blow, I will br- blow my own brains out with a shotgun so before I let one of you three touch he's me. He's answering all of us. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to run the train, is he? Who? <laughs> Who, Simon? Answer the question. <laughs> he's going to have a little just hole can... just, just in the, mm. the tent. <laughs> just to annoy just to annoy him then Chris I want you on top oh we god go. okay so you, <laughs> you've basically ran the train in this segment every one of us has had you on this segment I'm happy that's fine okay there we go and that's the end of see you next Tuesday Chris and as always here at the Grunt Forgets we'd like to give back to our community and give back to our listeners and like the old saying goes, a problem shared is a problem halved. And we are in the business of halving problems. <laughs> Duncan, what lost soul has been in touch with us this episode? We've got a cracker this week. It's a very recent one. So, dear Grumpy Gits, during half term, I found myself in an awkward situation with my daughter. 
My partner and I have been finding it difficult to get alone time to be intimate in any form due to the fact that no matter how much we want it, the constant presence of kids is acted as the world's most effective birth control. During half term, though, the, star, the stars seem to align, and my partner's son spent the week with his mum, meaning only my daughter, who is eight, would be at home. So first night of the break, we got my daughter to bed, and with all the enthusiasm of two people who've not done the D for far too long, started to manhandle each other. Sadly, I'm not able to enjoy this activity quietly. As things started to build, I was trying desperately to muffle my moans and groans, but to little effect. Without even really knowing, I was getting louder and louder. And as things started to build to the inevitable conclusion, our bedroom door burst open and my daughter came running in going terrified. My partner and I scrambled to look nonchalant and relaxed in our bed, despite the toys and handcuffs strewn around. And the more noticeable tent, more than noticeable tent under my partner's covers. Mummy, the house is haunted, she exclaimed as she ran and dived under my covers. Confused and more than a little frustrated, I tried to understand. What do you mean? I asked. I was asleep and I got woken by a moaning sound and it kept getting louder. It was so scary. It was in my walls. My face was now beetroot red. My partner's eye rolling had now become muffled laughs. The irresistible urge to burst out laughing was building and building. In order to defuse the situation, I told my daughter we'd go and check her room. <laughs> she climbed out of my bed and I attempted to follow, forgetting that my feet were tied together. <laughs> I got up from the bed and fell totally naked to the floor. Hurry up, mummy, my daughter said, thankfully failing to see the rope round my feet. I scrambled to untie myself and put on the robe, following her to the to her room. I performed the standard there's no monster routine checks. Wardrobe under the bed behind the doors, but nothing would convince her that there was no spooky presence within the walls. So my issue is this. Do I tell her the truth and risk scarring her young mind for life? Or do I continue to do our known and now nightly ghost check? <laughs> I oh I I, I would oh, say you, should, you got to tell her the truth, haven't you? Just say we're, they they were pretending to wrestle. That's what they were doing. You're saying <laughs> we were we were practicing WWF on the bed, or WWE it is now. Yeah, yeah. I was just saying the panda thing. Wow. Uh, do I tell her the truth? Do I tell her the truth? Or scar her for life? <laughs> I think that horse fucking bolted, didn't it? Like, no, what you do? There's a couple of questions. Uh, first is, how did she... Because they don't really sound similar, do they? The two sounds of the the ghost, the traditional ghost, doesn't really sound like... A porn star mid scene, does it? <laughs> I'll, I'll have you know, in the original Casper movie, he sounded exactly like an Lord Gathering female. <laughs> <laughs> See, what you I'm could do is, if you're going to scar her for life, what you want to do is get a really sharp knife, get your wedding ring, and put the ring on the knife, and then stab it into the, into the wall above her head. So when she wakes up in the morning, it looks like there's a ghost bin in the house, and someone's like ter- terrified her to death. Well, that took a turn. Jesus I was not expecting. <laughs> I'm going to switch caring. my answer from before because <laughs> apparently most world leaders are psychopaths. And clearly. Wow. <laughs> I, I don't think I feel comfortable fucking you in a tent anymore, Simon. I think it's going to on. <laughs> There's a danger element to that now, isn't there? <laughs> wow. Well, no. you know, if, if she's scared of the ghosts anyway, you know, you make sure she's shit scared of the ghosts, you know. No, just, t- just turn around her. and say, just turn around and say that it was mummy and me and daddy were singing. Oh, that's a good answer. <laughs> Quite simple. Again, yeah, just yeah, put yeah, yourself what in, you're in, in your shoes. You're saying that the standard doesn't ghost matter. doesn't sound like a woman orgasming. Yet, you oh. think you can get away with it being a song. <laughs> it doesn't. It's going to be muffled, and it was coming through the walls. So they could turn around and said they were singing a particular song. She's eight years old. Only if they're a fan of Slipknot, is it going to well, sound, see, you know. Fine. See, it was Slipknot. <laughs> it's fucking. Rob Zombie. <laughs> Who? No, no, he's a director. He doesn't play music. He's a director, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> 
Also, what was the deal with the uh, rope around the feet as well? She's been tied. I know, but tied together. Because that's the only yeah, way yeah. she'd stumble and fall, wouldn't it? Well, I assume so. I didn't get the full details. It didn't come with pictures. Chris, can you, can Chris, you go back to them and ask, please? Chris, it's called so foreplay, mate. We need full mate. details. Yeah, it, I know you're not <laughs> used to it. It's called foreplay. Do, do not... But- do not <laughs> try and lecture me on. <laughs> You're talking to a Jesus. man who owns a vibrator. Come on. <laughs> it is a massager, for fuck's sake. <laughs> That's what it said on the label. Yeah, it fucking right. did. Damn. Damn. Yeah. Amazon. Yeah. All the reviews saying how much my wife loved it didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> didn't click for me. It really didn't. Oh. <laughs> That's a bad oh, word. Five, five, five. <laughs> five stars. This solution won't wipe up something great. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was page after page. And after I read it back, I was like, you know what? This is making more sense. This doesn't sound like a massage in the house. <laughs> <laughs> what I love is it doesn't look like a massage. It fucking does. No, it doesn't. If it looks Don't like you your penis, it is not a massage for you. <laughs> It does. It, I wish it looked like my penis. Fucking hell! It seems <laughs> <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a baseball bat, Simon. I, 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 I like, a, like a baby's arm holding an apple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Fucking> massive. <laughs> oh, can't see. Anyway, where were? Yeah, look, look, like Chris. Oh. If her legs, if her legs are tied together, how's it going in? I don't get the mechanics. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, you've got oh, doggy I'm not, style, I'm, no, but you've I'm also sorry, got not, BDSM no, as well. No, I'm so. not doing the birds and the bees with Adam. I'm sorry. He's 30, God knows whatever. Simon, do not lecture no. when you're bad in bed. You have got no <laughs> leg to stand on or legs to stand on to lecture anybody on bedroom antics. Well, you would know in the, after that tent experience, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah I regret that. I regret right. that already. I, I think there's going to be two of us dropping out now. It's me and Adam. So, uh, <laughs> Duncan, you can have him. Jesus. Yeah. He's all yours. He's blown his chances with me and Adam. <laughs> yeah. No, just, just, just tell her the truth. I mean, she's eight. I'm surprised she doesn't already know. <laughs> I, I, I'd have been dead straight. I'd have been like, my mother was getting her brain sucked out. Go back to bed. <laughs> I would have scared the bed. shit out of her and put a, pretend there's a ghost in the house. <laughs> Says the man that wants to stab a, red, a wedding ring to her headboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, gentlemen, that has been fun. And I like to think that we solved the problem there somehow but what do i know i'm not a doctor if you have a dilemma you'd like us to solve and again i can't stress this enough please stop emailing emailing us with actual problems i know in the cost of living crisis i know there's energy bills that's not what we do here that's not what we do you've just seen what we do and i like to think we do it quite well so if you've got anything like that you want us to weigh in on absolutely email us get hold of us on twitter social media all all that jazz we're like four manly judge duties rolled into one it's great we're great people we're good we're good speaking of good segue um elon musk owns twitter and i for one i'm terrified and there's all this news about what might happen what might not happen am i gonna have to pay eight pound a month to keep my tick <laughs> who knows who knows not doing it that's for damn sure like how how do we feel about elon musk owning twitter simon go for it um well he's a businessman he's allowed to own a business um he is now effectively the most powerful man in the world. It's the biggest platform for messages, for social media, um, especially for the left wing. Um, and he can do or say whatever he likes. Uh, it's freedom of speech. It's freedom of democracy. He's the richest man on the planet and now easily the most powerful man on the, in the world, bigger than presidents, prime ministers, and everything else. Um, so you can't ignore him. Um, he has a global fund there's nothing stopping him taking over the rest of the world so you know it's but it'd be interesting to see what he actually does with it um because there isn't actually besides from sacking all the staff who were there 
Um, it'd be interesting if Trump comes back on board because obviously people died when he took he, when he decided let's go and you know go on Congress. Uh, yeah, as you do, let's go. Yeah. Um, so it, yes, Twitter needs um, it needs balancing. It needs to be proportionate. It can't be dangerous. Um, there is a difference between freedom of speech and putting people's lives in danger. Um, and that's where the, the balance has to be because it is a wonderful tool. It's a great tool, but also is uh, as anyone who's disabled, has a disability, who is uh, uh, popular like, like Adam, we also know how cruel and also illegal how it can be as well and how hate crimes can come about. So it needs better um, legislation. It needs better oversight. Uh, I hope he will introduce it. Uh, Duncan, do you think he will? Or do you think um, the inmate is on the asylum at this point? I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's scary. I, I think the fact that his first act was to, I'm going to just dismiss the rest of the board, so I'm now the only board member, shows that there's a real egotistical side to this, a megalom- megalomaniacal side to this. Uh, he's in control of this massive platform. He's already talking about letting Trump back on. And, I, yeah, I just, it, it, it's, 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 I find it genuinely scary. And, I mean, he's already the master of manipulation. And we saw that with the whole blue tick thing. Because he started off with 20 quid a month or $20 a month. And then it was like everyone was up in arms. And, oh, would you prefer it if I did eight? And that's a, a true sort of sale, like a marketing tactic. You put in something people are going to hate so you can take it away. And then you've got what's left, which is $8. And it seems a lot more palatable because people are so focused on the 20. What he's actually done is just put an $8 charge on there. So that's manipulation 101. And he's, he's, he's a master of it. That's exactly what he's done. And so people aren't making as much fuss about eight pounds now or eight dollars because it was twenty dollars before. Um, I just think he's he's no no platform should be in one man's hands like that, and that's what we've got now. And I mean, you know, yeah, social media itself has become such a toxic place. There's so much good stuff on there, you know. It, there's lots of Facebook groups which are really good for helping people. There's lots of Twitter communities which are really good for helping people. There's so much good on there. But the trouble is it's all so poison. It's like the poison chalice of just everything is corrupted now. I'm used to the Pharisees, if you like. It's just spread through the whole crop. And it's just, it's a horrible place, in my opinion. And where, where do you stand on this, Chris? Are we going to see the likes of Donald Trump, Katie Hopkins and Andrew Tate return to the platform? I think so. I, it's, it's a bit confusing um, what he's actually got in mind. Um, he's, he's saying about free speech, which um, the way he puts it is it, it almost seems viable, a, a viable tactic. The issue is, is that what he's got in his head isn't what's in the real world. You look at companies like Cambridge Analytica uh, and think tanks um, the Russians getting involved with the presidential election, which obviously put Trump into power. All of these things can be manipulated, and his platform will be the source for it. So like Simon says, he's he's the most powerful man on the planet now. There's, if he wants to overturn, uh, he can get involved with Twitter and flood it so the candidate he wants goes in. So I think it's... It's so, so dangerous um, to have this, uh, just one man at the wheel running this. Um, It is slightly worrying. I just hope that countries, the EU, even in some respects America, they put legislation in place to try and counter what Twitter can do. So uh, that's the only saving grace. Is Twitter as we know it over? Or do you think people are maybe over-exaggerating a little bit? And then when it all comes down to brass tacks, not a lot will actually change. Duncan. 
I think I think I think this is the problem. I think it's the analogy of you know how do you cook a frog? You just chuck it in boiling water, it'll jump out. So what you do is you put it in cold water and it sits there and you slowly turn the heat up. So I think initially, no, there won't be a lot of change. It'll be subtle, small changes. And then we'll look back in five, ten years' time and think, what the fuck? So you reckon we're on to like a slow march to madness? Yeah. I'll say. Is this enough of a problem? whereby any of us are rethinking our relationship with Twitter. Because I, I have to use it for work. We do a lot of social media stuff for the Grumpy Gits on, on Twitter alongside Disability Expo. And as uh, as we've all said, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's a great thing, but it can also be a dangerous thing. Are any of us reassessing our relationship with Twitter? based upon the um, Elon Musk takeover? Not at the moment. Um, I remember being told a story once where Rupert Murdoch, who possibly is the most influential person in the UK because of all the media that he owns, he said, and it, this is a quote from Rupert Murdoch when he walked into a room once, from what I understand, and he said, if I walked into 10 Downing Street, they'll do exactly what I say. If I walked into the EU, they would absolutely ignore me. And the problem is, with Twitter, Elon Musk doesn't have to walk anywhere. He can win an, ele- win an election, a presidential election. He can turn a prime minister upside down if he wanted to with one tweet. That's how powerful he is at the moment. And it is very scary. Luckily, you know, he's not hopefully a maniac. <laughs> he's just enthusiastic. Um... And he is a businessman, so hopefully he's got some intelligence there. But I'm concerned about the power he has. I'm concerned about what he will do with it. But I think we have to wait and see until what what is going to happen in the next year or so with Twitter. So at the moment, nothing's changed for me because of that. Um, I use it every day. I use it for Snowball. I use it for the Grumpy Gits. Um, I use it for polls, for research. Um, it is a fantastic tool in that aspect. But I... Depending on what he does, I will have to have a rethink about it. No, I don't. I don't think it's going to change as much. It's like Duncan said. I think it will be so gradual that we won't even notice it until we actually look back over our shoulder from five years ago. Um, it's it's not really going to change. It's not going to change the people. It, it all depends. It, it's like saying what look into a crystal ball and. and predict the future. There's no way to actually do that and to see what he's going to put there. It's worrying his views at the moment um, that he's starting to voice them a lot more and they seem a lot more right-wing than I thought they were going to be, especially when he was talking about solving world hunger, a very much socialist and left-wing view. Um, and now he's he's banging on about free speech and, and everything else, which is, is obviously more right-wing than anything else because a lot of people take advantage of it. Um, so, no, I, it's not going to affect me. Not really. Too small. I, oh, yeah. I'd like to say that I'm a huge fan of Elon Musk and agree with everything he's ever done and ever said. Please don't take my blue check. Please don't take my blue check. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of really bad shit to get that blue ticket on. You got no, you got no idea. I had to inter- I was interviewed by Quinny and Susanna to get that blue tick. Please don't take it away from me. Time now for one of our patented Grumpy Gits interviews. That's right, we invented interviews. Don't Google it. Just take my word for it. <laughs> Tweet it. <Duncan. laughs> Read it. Duncan, who did we have the absolute pleasure of speaking to this episode? We spoke to the amazing Kelly Waite, who you may well know from Obsessive Compulsive Cleaners and a couple of other TV show offshoots that had. But I mean, she's an amazing person who is a real advocate for mental health. Uh, she has fibromyalgia. She's obviously got OCD. She is a neurodivergent individual as well. And we got to sit down with her, Adam and myself, and chat to her about uh, what's going on, what she's doing, and her new film that's coming as well that she's made. So here we are with Kelly Waite. 
Yep, thanks, Adam. And we are here this week with the amazing Kelly Wait, Kelly, how are you? Hi, yeah, I'm okay. How are you? Uh, you? You're brightening up the screen on what's generally four very ugly blokes. Well, <laughs> three and Chris, who kind of passes, and Adam, of course. Uh, if you guys don't know Kelly Wade, or if you sort of think, I know that face, but we're from, Kelly's a mainstay, especially on Channel 4. She's done things like uh, obsessive compulsive cleaners and or a bunch of spin-off shows to that, but much more than that, she's a massive advocate for the anti-bullying campaigns. She's also uh, an actress, and she's made her own movie, which we'll talk about in the uh, moments to come so what are you doing at the moment is there anything that's pressed particularly uh on the cards at the moment actually i'm doing a full-length documentary right now basically going to be a documentary just documenting everything that i've been doing and mainly focusing on physical and mental illnesses as well just tell us about that i mean you you, you you're saying this that this is a documentary made about you You've got, I mean, you've got quite a list of things that you live with day to day that people probably wouldn't realise just looking at you. Uh, what is it, you know, what are your diagnoses, if you like, or the things that you sort of deal with every day? My diagnoses, uh, I've got Hashimoto's, which is a autoimmune illness. So basically my immune system attacks my thyroid gland. So I have that. Um, I have autoimmune thyroiditis, which is what, well, that's what it was called back in Australia. But I yeah. have that. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, exactly that. I recently, like, just 12 months ago, I had um, half my thyroid out. Like, I don't know if you can see, but I've got, like, a Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, because um, I had, like, a nodule on half of my thyroid, which is common when you have Hashimoto's. But I kept going to get a biopsy, and, like, it was okay, and it was okay. Then it got to where it was intermediate, which is, like, they don't know whether it's cancer. They can't say for sure. So they would rather get it out than, like, wait. But at the time, I didn't really want it out, you know, because I had stuff going on. I was like, oh, well, I'll just wait because if you don't know, it could be, you know, it could be Absolutely. either way. But then after a year, it got to the point where you couldn't wait no more because my, my cells had changed. So, like, they were, like, be cancerous. So I had no other choice. I had to get it out. What, what other sort of things are you, you living with day to day? So I've also got OCD, like really bad OCD. And I have Asperger's, which is like um, on the autistic spectrum. It is, in fact. I mean, what what I obviously, I mean, my wife, my daughter especially, they are both autistic. Yeah. And they don't even refer to Asperger's anymore in the sort of medical world because yeah. they've understood that by – it, it lessens its severity in the sense of how it sounds, but actually living with it, 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 just because you appear to be functioning, especially for women, interestingly, doesn't mean there's not a lot going on under the surface. Like well, what you've just said about women as well, it's really hard to diagnose women <laughs> because we do this thing called masking. So oh, yeah. uh, we're really good at masking. <laughs> I didn't get diagnosed till a couple of years ago. So... I was like, you know, good at masking. With people that have physical disabilities, you know, it's there to see. And I know there's like a lot of judgment, especially I've seen online a lot, you know, with blue badges and stuff where people are confronting people that aren't like in a wheelchair and stuff. Yep. That does go on a lot because people do view people from how, how what they see. With physical stuff, they can see it, but with invisible stuff, they can't. So if they look at someone and they they look okay and then they just assume that there's nothing wrong with them so then straight away it's like you've got to like try and convince people masking is my big sort of push at the moment i i but i got to speak at the tesn show a few weeks ago and i actually spoke about masking because i want educational professionals to understand just how important this is because just because a kid seems to be functioning at school they're, they're bottling it all day and it's exploding at home and it gets in the way of diagnosis massively yeah i think a lot with women is they kind of they're good at like holding stuff in and like fitting into all the different surroundings but i think with boys they just show it how they are so it'll come out in behavioral stuff where girls they tend to like come out in other things my best friend she was the one who sent me some information on asperger's because a relative of hers like her daughter they were in the middle of like looking into Asperger's for her. So she sent me loads of information asking if I'd look through it with her and stuff. And when I was looking through, I was just seeing myself, basically. So, Kelly, 
how how do you balance managing um OCD etc. And, and your mental health with being um quote unquote famous and having a a public persona. Well, to be honest, it I've used it as a platform to kind of promote awareness for OCD. Like I did the shows basically to to promote awareness for OCD. To be to be fair, though, <clears> when I when I did the shows, I hadn't really gone public with my OCD. So there was like mm-hmm. even family members who didn't even know that I had OCD because I hid it. I've had it all my life though, like as far back as what I can remember. I remember having it as a child. And so it was, it's always been a part of me. But when, I, when I'm going through like severe anxiety and I get really anxious or panicky, my OCD gets like really, really bad. Just going to bed on a nice, you know, your nighttime routine. It can take me like an hour and a half to get into bed because of my routines. And when I did the shows, you know, from locals, like worldwide, I've had loads of amazing feedback from loads of people. It's been on the whole really, really you know good in locally because i'm from a little village like in county durham i've had nothing but hate from local haters i had so much bullying when i when i first started on them shows it was horrendous like i had to get it was that bad i had to get the police involved because they'd be coming to my house hanging out outside my house harassing me be driving past in the street shouting abuse at me making fake facebook accounts so messaging people like with my name using like the, the fake account it was really really bad like even now like every time I'm in the paper or something like doing my charity work or like doing some tv show or something the hate that I get from the local haters is, is you would not believe how bad it is I and mean, they never give up because this has been going on since 2008 you know when I was first in beauty pageants Constant, constant, constant. I got to the point where, where, when I was on the first show, I was literally offered, a couple of months later, I was off, like, offered like the first spin-off show. Because obviously it's, it, it was promoting OCD, but, you know, it's all like made for TV. So, you know, it's like structured and um, scripted and, mm-hmm. you know, it's tongue in cheek and having a laugh. And I had an amazing experience with everyone involved. But it's designed to be entertaining as much as informative. Yeah, Yeah, completely. People watch it and they're like, oh, they'll pick out something I said and then they'll bully me on it saying that, you know, I shouldn't have said this and all that. But, you know, you're told what to say basically and it's like all just like basically fun. It was really funny. You know, it was a really funny show and everything. But they'll pick pick stuff out and... I got offered the spin-off show a couple of months after that, and I wasn't even going to take it because of all of the like the hell that I had after I appeared on that show. It didn't even start when I was on the show. It started when I was on the trailer because the, there was a clip of me in the trailer. So it literally started a week before the show even come on because I was in the trailer. Then I did a BBC um, news interview about OCD. The hate I got from that, like people saying, how dare I go on... Um, you know, TV and talk about OCD and, mm-hmm. you know, that I should be embarrassed and ashamed and stuff, you know, and they, they were making me feel like that I should have hid the fact that I had OCD and I shouldn't even dare speak about the fact. Mm-hmm. You know, I was treated worse than a criminal. I swear to God, I was treated really bad. I couldn't even walk to my local shop. It was like, you know, in the olden days when they would, like, um, burn the witches and stuff and there'd be a witch <laughs> and like They were coming with all the, like, the... Pitchforks and torches, they're all standing out there waiting for you. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Game of Thrones. Shame. Shame. (laughs) Right, right. Um, Shame. It was as if I'd committed the worst crime known to man. And all I'd basically done was follow my dreams and like spread an awareness for. I'd see this with Adam. I mean, oh, the stuff that you go through. Adam handles it beautifully because he just makes them look like the idiots they are. With this kind of avant-garde plum that he just <laughs> he just absolutely um, um, tears them to pieces. Unless it's really, really serious. Jealousy makes people tell the worst lies on you, and mm. that's something that stuck with me because it's so true. Okay, let's <laughs> backtrack a little bit. So, what all this this hate and this and let's call it what it is bullying. 
is yeah. going on. Did you, because I used to work for the company who made OCD cleaners and country house cleaners. So I know a little bit about the, the process you'd had to go through and talking to um, Dr. H and, and stuff. What kind of support, kind of psychological support, did you receive from the, the show and the company? Initially, like before you go on the show, you get like a screen and with a psychologist and stuff. And then during during the whole show, you get you get a you know every day on hand whenever you need it. But after the show, like you don't get well. I didn't get much support mental health wise. There there really wasn't nothing after the the shows had finished. It was really hard because it, it it was kind of like you were just stuck in the deep end because they do prepare you for for what's to come because they do say you're gonna get bad comments. It's just you're gonna get it. I don't think you know how you're going to feel until that actually happens. I mean, to be honest now, my skin is so much darker than what it was back then. I really couldn't care less now. Like, people could say whatever they want about me. I've, I've learned to do it. You develop like, a callous, don't you? I look back and I think, why did you let it bother you so much? And I, I, can't, I can't explain why I did what I did. And I swear to God, it, it, it got me, like, on the edge. I mean, the, the dark like thoughts did cross my mind you know at that time i just felt like the whole world hated me do you think they just don't realize the impact it has or they don't care is it is it that they think this is just going to get me some likes and some notoriety or is it that they that they generally don't care about the impact they have? do you think it's that do you think it's the anonymity that's allowing this do you think people <laughs> realize what they're saying I think for some people it is because a lot of people use fake accounts to write like horrible things, mm. but a lot of people use the real accounts and you'll go on to them and like, they're like, they're putting pictures on like saying be kind and they're, they're promoting bullying themselves and mm. yes, they're bullying as well. And, you know, they'll have kids and I don't understand it because, you know, I've had the worst bullying from like local people. So it's people who I actually know. They're not anonymous, you know, they're not hiding behind a computer. Fair enough. They haven't said it to me like face to face. And fair enough. I mean, there's jokes, there's tongue, tongue in cheap behavior, you know, you know, there's like banter. But then there's just really damn right horrible and um, abusive comments. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. There's, there's no excuse um, for it. So I don't understand what would make any person do anything like that because i wouldn't dream of seeing some of the stuff that i've seen on social media said about people and it's why why are you saying it because the, the word banter is one that gets thrown around a lot yeah. uh, and i think sometimes it's used as a, a get out of jail free card to me yeah. banter is, is uh, more relational than topical or situation. We have a lot of banter on this show, don't we? We oh, we we we, we, we go forth. for it, but we know each other. Like we, we know each other, we, and we know that beneath that, there's a deep love and respect yeah. for each other that comes out. Yeah, yeah, um, and we also we also earn the right, right? We we put up with Chris for two years, <laughs> right? <laughs> If I want to call him gentle Ben but a prick, I will call him gentle Ben. <laughs> but the actual words I've said, this is going to sound bizarre, but try and stay with me. I don't mind the behaviour in and of itself. It's the lack of accountability mm -hmm. yeah. I'm bothered by. And if you're going to do it, own it. Someone wants some put on one of my videos, oh, imagine seeing him down a dark alley. And then I replied, well, then that's not a dark alley. That's a well-lit alley with a disabled guy in it. <laughs> like, try harder. And then and then straight away, it's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. My cousin spelt wrong, had my phone spelt wrong. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, dude, own, like, own, own your shit. Own it. You were going for Sonny. You came over 20. We've all done it. I've done it. I've said things about people online that I sincerely regret. Yeah, definitely, definitely own what you're saying, because obviously, if you've said it, then, I mean, there's there's no getting away from the fact that you've said it, whether you want to blame your dog, your cousin, or whatever, you know, we all know that it was you, so just, yeah, definitely own it. This this experience obviously directed you towards a real passion for standing up for bullying, because you obviously, you, you're a, an ambassador for a Canadian charity, is that right, on anti-bullying? Worth Living is a Canadian charity, that, that's that like deals with like mental health and stuff and like everything that comes with that like bullying and um, anything to do with mental health 
I'm also like an ambassador for Bullies Out, which is like a UK bullying charity. Yeah, bullying is a, a topic really close to my heart because, you know, sadly, there is a lot of lives lost over bullying. And I do think that even now, even though like the world is more accepting, like in a way of a lot of things, and there's so much more awareness out there, with it, there's so much like, still so much like work to do because there's so mm. much more bullying i think more now than what there ever was kelly i want to i want to bring this back to so i mean we, we've discussed the ocd I, I also i mean you talked about the fact that you you've got or you're autistic and you are um neurodivergent i guess and you're experiencing these things you've gone through the bullying you've gone through all these things you've really made yourself a champion for for these people and for yourself. Uh, I, I really like that you've got that pride in it. That's taken you on now to this uh, short film you've made. I believe you've directed, you're in, all about OCD and what it's like living with it. Well, to be honest, it's like basically just the struggle of someone with OCD and the like ramifications, I guess, that it could have on somebody in that it's kind of like a struggle that nobody knows like it's a, wow. just her own struggle and it's kind of like a da story but i wanted it to be like you know hard hitting you know i didn't yeah. want to like um tiptoe around the subject you're stuff. not pulling it's, punches on this this is honest you know, warts and all there's there is so much stigma still you yeah. know especially for like mental health and you know, any any kind of, like, disorders like that. And for some reason, I think it was glamorized a bit OCD because people would just think, oh, it, it's someone who likes to clean. When it's we become, OCD's become something that's almost sort of, it's it's a tagline now, isn't it? I'm a bit OCD about that. I'm a bit OCD about this and whatever. Oh, I but hate Actually, oh. that really diminishes what people who genuinely experience <laughs> OCD every day go through. People don't understand who just think it's about cleaning, how debilitating it can be. Kelly, I can't thank you enough for joining us. If people want to reach out to you, see your documentary, see your film that you've made, where can they do this? Okay, well, um, they can go on my Facebook at Kelly Waite BCA or Twitter at Miss Kelly Waite. Or they can see my movie on Samsung TV, um, Amazon Fire Stay. Baku. What we'll do is we'll put all these links in the description, so you you can uh, who are watching you can hop over, click straight on the um, links, and you'll get straight to all the bits and pieces that Kelly's doing. Because get out there and support. And one more thing I want to ask is that I, I want to go back to the bullying thing because it's really something that I think is so important. If you're experiencing bullying, where would you recommend people can go to get support for that? They can come straight to my inbox. I mean, I'm there 24-7, you know, you can come and talk to me any time of the day. I would also say just go to anybody, anybody you trust, whether it's your best friend. I know it's hard, especially for the younger generation, to go to your parents. I know that's really hard. But go to your friend, go to a school counsellor. I know in in my personal experience, it's easier to speak to people that you don't know, like over the phone, like a counsellor. Just please speak to somebody, really. And, and there are anti-bullying charities out there that will pick up the phone and listen bullying, to you. The Samaritans, there's so many people out there who are 24-hour support. And like I said, my inbox is always there if you ever need to talk to somebody. And you... Kelly, I can't thank you enough for joining us. This has been fascinating and enlightening in so many ways. Thank you so much, both of you, for having me. I've loved it. Fantastic. Okay. Thank we you. will hand over to the main episode again. So back to Adam on the main podcast. Thank you, us in the past, and especially thank you to Kelly. Um, pleasure talking to you. All her socials are in the show notes. Go give her a follow and, and keep an eye on what she is doing. Gentlemen, a a man who's been in the news a lot recently, and I must admit I haven't followed this as closely as I'd like to, is a Mr. Eddie Izzard. I say Mr. Maybe that's part of the conversation that we we need to have. Um, can one of you guys bring us all up to date on why Eddie Izzard has been in the news? 
Yeah, so Eddie Izzard, who's standing for Parliament as a Labour MP, he's wanted to do this for a number of years. Um, he's a uh, been a Labour supporter for for decades, and he uh, wants to represent the, his local area to be an MP. And you know what? I say give it a go. I, and I'm not too sure if he actually wants to be referred to he or she. I'm not too clear on that. But when I read and uh, when I was seeing a news report the other day, they were referring to Eddie as she. Um, that doesn't interest me at all. You can call yourself what you like. Um, I think if it's issues between he and she, I think that takes away from what the important messages he's trying to get out because um, you call yourself he, she, lad, boy, girl, whatever. doesn't bother me. But yeah, you know, if he's trying to get an important message out that most MPs are corrupt and he wants to do something about it. She's also been going ahead and really challenging the transphobia that is in the government at the moment. And Eddie's opened up about her own feelings with that and what she's doing with that and really challenged the, the status quo on it, I think, which is, I think, really good. I, I completely agree. I think the um, the uh, pronouns thing, like Simon said, if that's how she wants to be referred to, happy days, rock and roll, um, not not a problem. So I do worry it, it, A, takes away a gain from actual policy and I'm worried that the the noise of the pronoun conversation will overtake the actual good mess the actual positive policies that she wants to put in and place. I, yeah, I completely agree with that. It's there are so many big things that need to be solved and referring to she, he, calling himself Eddie, whatever it will be, does get in the way because it's picked up on every media stream and every story. And that's the headline at the moment. Unfortunately, it shouldn't be. You know, if if uh, Eddie wants to be called a she, that I've got no issue with that at all. But she has to reflect that that is going to be the main story before any policy is put in Parliament. It's the uh, it's the main story in in right wing um, newspapers. That's that's the only thing, and, and the Tories are, are attacking because of it. And yeah. a lot of us, I mean, we're kind of out of place a little bit to be discussing it for the sole reason that we would, as being supportive, as we've all just stated, uh, as being misogynistic. And of course, there's that culture war out there that's saying, well, he wants to take away safe spaces from women. And I've been on many, many arguments with women who are saying, well, you're misogynistic for uh, sticking up for him. Graham Norton. And, of course, he put it in, in such a way that, look, look ask, ask trans people what they're going through. Uh, it, it, you go to the voice. You, you, you go to the horse's mouth to find out exactly what's going on. And he got hounded off of Twitter because of it by women who were saying, well, look, you're being misogynistic. You want to take away our safe spaces. I had a very interesting conversation this week with a lady. So uh, a lady I know, her daughter has Down syndrome and she's got two other neurodivergent kids as well. And bumped into her at a cafe. She was with her mother. And it was really interesting talking to her mother because her mother was saying, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm not trying to go out and offend anybody because she kept referring to normal which is a big issue for a lot of people who are, when you refer to somebody who's neurodivergent as being abnormal, that's the implication when you use the term normal. But she was really upset. She was like, I'm not trying to be offensive. I've just This is what I've always grown up with. I think there has to be a level of understanding to that, that people have to adjust. I have to adjust to how I, you know, refer to, like referring to Eddie Izzard, using the she, her pronouns is exactly the right thing to do. But my... Instinct is because I've always referred to Eddie Izzard as a he previously to this. It's always something that, that, that that's always been. So it's, you know, changing my own language in that is a tricky thing. But there's a point where I think the response from, I don't know who it was responding, but it was like, there's no way I'm using those pronouns when referring to Eddie. And I, I can't remember who it was I was reading about it. But it was like, well, that's just the point. And I think when you say that it's getting in the way of, he, the when you say it's getting in the way of the policies being put forward, I think that's Eddie's policies are actually wrapped up in that. Part of what she's trying to present is in that. And I think it's like you say, we're trying to reprogram what we've always thought. But when we live in a a culture that's so politically correct, or or at least charged with an element of political correctness 
on one hand versus freedom of speech on the other and ah oh, you're woke ah oh, you're a bigot ah oh, what mm. do we do uh, I think you need to create a safe space for people to get it wrong and be lovingly corrected and, and learn like whenever I do disability inclusion training for like banks and tech companies I always say I don't expect you to get it right the first time ignorance is an excuse the first time and then once you've been lovingly corrected and you know better, you then know. But you don't know what you don't know equally. But then if there's not that safe space to have the conversation and you just get instantly shouted down and called either a bigger a misogynist or a snowflake, people just aren't going to go there. They're just going to sit in noble silence and be like, ah, oh, someone else can deal with that. I can't. I can't be asked to be shouted down. I I agree with you on on that point, but that I think it's I I don't think people go out of their way if that safe space was created and people went there. I don't th- people don't like being told they're wrong on social media. They hate it. In fact, they don't go to social media to learn. They would rather argue their point. They'd rather be wrong and win an argument than be right and back down. It, 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 it does it, it social media is is one of those places where it's it brings out the worst in some people and i think a chip on people's shoulder is exactly what that brings out when it comes to this when they're being informed and told they feel small and they feel stupid and they don't want to accept that i don't think the safe spaces would work well not certainly not online but i think in in the physical world we can real world absolutely real world of- absolutely of open conversation and yeah. what have you. But the amount of times people have like come at me online and I've been like, can you just clarify what you mean by that last tweet? And then I just repeat themselves. And I'm like, no, no, no. That's not what I asked you. I heard, I, I read the tweet. You don't need to repeat it. I'm just asking for a bit more extrapolation, yeah. if you will. I think what we need to do, because we've always said on this show that we never talk over anybody. And when we've had neurodivergent people, you know, issues and stuff related to autism, we've always brought autistic people on board to be part of that discussion. I think what we need to do is engage with somebody, you know, or some people in the trans community and bring them onto the show to talk about it from their perspective. Yeah. And I think that's where we should leave it lie. We can, we've said enough that we know where we stand, but I'm more than prepared to be corrected where I need to be. And I think we all pretty much sit in that same well, let, position. Let's invite. Let's let's see if uh, Eddie will come on. That would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, there we go, Eddie. As I do, are more than welcome on the the ground to get any time you should so choose. And now over to Chris Lee Smith to announce the winners of our spooky Halloween contest. Thank you, Adam. So the wonderful people at the Disability Expo have tasked the Grumpy Gids with judging their staff Halloween costume and pumpkin carving competition. After much deliberation and debate, we have now chosen our winners. The costume winner, we couldn't look any further than the King of Pop, the Thriller costume, sported by Lachlan. The pumpkin winner, Paul has played a blinder. He's appealed to our grumpy side while fallen up with SpongeBob. We just want to say... Great effort by everybody. Well done. At the time of filming this segment, Disability History Month is almost upon us. Disability History Month will run from the 16th of November to the 16th of December this year. This annual event creates a platform to focus on the history of our struggle for equality and human rights. The team behind UK Disability History Month have announced this year's theme as Disability, Health and Wellbeing. They say the COVID pandemic has demonstrated across the UK and around the world just how fragile the rights that disabled people have secured for themselves are and how easily we become expendable. The years of austerity aimed at disabled people and destroying our well-being arise from deeply held perceptions of our unworthiness rooted in the past history of our oppression. UK Disability History Month will examine this history and provide examples of how this denial of human rights can and will be reversed. 
On our own platforms, we will be launching the month with an exclusive interview between our social media manager, Chandy, and Richard Reza, the founder of UK Disability History Month. Here is a small preview from that interview. Our biggest problem as disabled people, whether we have physical, sensory, uh, mental impairments, uh, psychosocial, it doesn't matter. Our biggest problem is not our impairment. Our biggest problem is societal attitudes and the resulting infrastructure and environment that comes from that and the way that institutions and organisations operate. We call that disabilism, a systematic prejudice towards people who are physically or mentally different. Richard and the UK Disability History Month team will be hosting their official online launch event on the evening of Thursday 17th of November. Head to the website at ukdhm.org to be emailed the Zoom link. Follow our social media channels for more Disability History Month content. And don't forget to register your free ticket for Disability Expo next July, where we will be further promoting the importance of disability history at the event. And that, gentlemen, brings us to the end of another fantastic Ooh. episode. Ooh, I've really enjoyed myself. Always a pleasure to hang out with you guys. This is genuinely one of the highlights of my fortnight, just coming and sitting down and shooting the breeze with my mates. Chris Lee Smith, if people want to get hold of you and engage with you on the social medias and find out what you're up to, how can they do that? They can find me on Twitter, and it's the Real Grump Dad. And Duncan Casman, how can people find you? Uh, PDA Dad UK on pretty much any social media platform or YouTube. And uh, Simon Samson, if cowboys want to bang you in a tent, where can they find you? <laughs> they can do it on Ability Access on Facebook page, or they can download the Snowball app where you can leave reviews on accessibility. <laughs> <laughs> and snowball again. <laughs> it's just all. <laughs> and you can find me on Adam underscore Pearson on the old Twitter machine. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, follow us at Grumpy Git Show online. And as always, don't be grumpy alone. See you next time. <laughs>